All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and on behalf of the Earth Institute, I'd actually like to welcome you to um, today's Sustainable Development Seminar Series, where we're going to be discussing the history of science and sustainable development. My name is Patricia Culligan, and I'm going to be moderating, introducing and moder moderating the seminar series today. And I just wanted to run through with you quickly how we're going to be um, running the seminar and um, also my own interest in this particular topic. So with respect to how we're going to be running the seminar, I'm going to give a brief introduction to how I became interested in the history of science and how that could shape the way we think about forming new disciplines in the field. And then I was going to introduce briefly the topics that our three panelists are going to be discussing today and give you just um, an overview of how that feeds into shaping the seminar. And then the three panelists were going to speak and I was um, hoping that we could hold discussion and questions and answers until after all the panelists have sp spoken. They'll be talking for about 20 minutes each and they were going to throw the floor out to the audience for you to actually make comments or ask questions um, of the panelists um, or uh, some of the other topics that are raised during the discussion afterwards. So we have about um, just under two hours to, to move this forward. Um, so how did this seminar come about? Um, I and a couple of other members of the Earth Institute have been talking with Pamela Smith, who unfortunately was unable to make today's event because of a teaching conflict, about um, science studies at the university um, and how science studies might inform the education of our students and us as a community of scholars. And we at the Earth Institute have actually been particularly interested in the science of um, the history of science and technology and the role that history has played in shaping the way that we might think about um, the science of sustainability, um, which is a topic that the Earth Institute at Columbia University has been seeking to play a leadership role in developing globally. Um, so Pamela came to talk to the Education Committee of the Earth Institute, of which I'm a member, about introducing um, science studies and the history of science and technology into some of the curricula that we support as a faculty. And through that discussion, we thought it would be quite interesting to open it to a broader audience, which included not just students, but, but faculty and other members of our community, and see if this could be a nucleation point for discussing how lessons learned in the history of science and technology could shape um, forward decisions that we make as an Earth Institute as we move the sustainability of science forward. Now, personally, I've been quite interested in, um, in the history of, of disciplines through some research that I did a couple of years ago, um, which involved writing a book chapter for uh, the Oxford Handbook of Interdisciplinarity. And they were interested in how the history of disciplines shaped our thinking about um, interdisciplinary studies in the 21st century. So I just wanted to walk through with you the history of my own discipline. I'm a civil engineering professor. And um, civil engineering claims to be the oldest engineering discipline, and it was actually um, brought to bear in 1768 when a British engineer defined himself as a civil engineer to distinguish himself from military engineers or engineers that were engaged both in civilian and military work at the time. And from this declaration evolved a society of civil engineers in the UK that was the first engineering society um, formally formed, um, and they managed to get a royal charter and become an institute in 1818. And the charter that they used to form the institute was later taken up by the American Society of Civil Engineers in 1852, and so they're the first engineering profession uh, that were established in, uh, in the U.S. And what is fascinating to me that in the last 150 or so years, we've actually added a new engineering discipline almost one per year. So starting from an engineering discipline that defined itself as everything that wasn't military, we now have over 130 engineering disciplines that are recognized at the national level in the US. And within the discipline of um, civil engineering um, currently now, 
the, um, and I'm actually on the board of governors of one of their institutes, they publish alone 33 journals. So if you multiply 33 by the number of disciplines that are recognized nationally, we've gone from one discipline that was very broadly defined to over 130 sub-disciplines, and we're within that, each of them probably, over 130 other disciplines, and within that, each of them probably has 30 or so more sub-disciplines. So it's quite fascinating that over such a short period of time in mankind's history, we've managed to sort of get more and more specifically focused. And when I looked into the history of this evolution of engineering disciplines, I found that they were shaped not only by need, there was a need for people to come together and to share knowledge and to educate people that, want, that were interested in the field that they were all um, partnering in. But it was also this demarcation of professional and intellectual territories that drove a lot of that. And also, who was at the table? So who was there to define what a discipline was and what the need for another discipline was and what the need for a sub-discipline within the discipline was? Um, and now the um, Institute of Civil Engineers is defining what it calls a body of knowledge, which is supposed to define what is needed to become a civil engineer at the undergraduate, the graduate, and then the young professional level to practice in the 21st century. And this is also quite interesting. Um, in the framework of the discussion that we're going to be having today. But their recent, um, their recent publication of their body of knowledge, too, in 2008, actually proposed that people studying civil engineering or coming into the profession would need 24 learning outcomes, each with six individual achievement levels, in order to gain entry into the discipline. So if you look at that, that's really 96 checkboxes that people now need to have to get into the discipline. And I think another meta lesson that um, I want to throw out on the floor that relates to this is, is that what's also happening with these evolutions of disciplines and sub-disciplines within disciplines is there's an increasing precision associated with the definition of these disciplines that is also being driven by who is at the table. And the entry level to these disciplines, the bar of entry level to these disciplines has been raised higher and higher. So who's at the table is also looking back and defining who can get on the pathway to um, contributing in these particular areas. All right, so to try and tie that into how this feeds into today's um, seminar agenda, we have, we have three speakers, and what we're going to be looking at is, is first sort of the, the history of what um, sustainable development is and how that has evolved over time and how it's actually been shaped by the people that have been sitting at the table and have been contributing to some of the vocabulary and some of the, um, the discussion that we've been having around that. And that's going to be, um, that's going to be discussed by um, Kivita um, Sriva Rama. Krishnan, who is a professor in our School of Public Health at Columbia University. I'm not going to go through her biography because um, it's, it's written out quite nicely in the handouts that you have. But Kavita is not only a professor in public health, she has a training in history at, at Cambridge University. And um, she's done a lot of interesting work that's actually been looking at how sustainability um, and sustainable development has been forming over the last, um, the last few decades. So we're going to be starting the discussion with sort of shaping how it is the field that we're going to be talking, just sort of understanding how that came to be and what were the forces that, that um, brought it from where it evolved to where we are now. Um, and then Professor... Um, Robert Pollock, who is a professor of biological sciences at Columbia University and also a member of the Earth Institute faculty, is going to be talking to us about um, his experience in the development of molecular biology as a new discipline. Um, and he's entitled it The short, short Life of a New Field. And I think what he's going to be bringing to the table is some lessons that are learned from shaping new fields, not like the civil engineering discipline, which I introduced to you, which is actually formed very robustly to the point where we have 33 sub-disciplines in, in that field and it's well recognized nationally, but how other pathways that people can embark on when they shape new disciplines cannot lead us to the point where we have a, a robust new discipline and where we actually want to be if we're shaping a new discipline. And finally, um, Peter Slosher, who is a professor of Earth and Environmental Engineering and also Earth and Environmental Science, and he chairs the Earth Institute faculty, is going to be talking to us about sustainable development and um, 
some ideas that he has um, on this as a new academic discipline, is there justification for this as a new academic discipline? And if yes, what pathway should the Earth Institute be um, treading along as we try and lead in the area of sustainable development? So I'm going to ask um, our first speaker, Kavita, to, to step up. And um, then Bob is going to follow, and then Peter is going to follow. And as I said, afterwards, we'll take the questions and answering. So we, we're going to try and step through the, um, through the, through the, um, the talks sort of sequentially without disruption. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Patricia, for such a generous introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the Earth Institute for inviting me to join you in the discussion this evening. Unlike many of you, I haven't spent my career um, researching sustainable development, and I presume many of you are experts and faculty in the arena. But um, what really drew me to this panel when I talked to Patricia last week was that really, um, as a historian of global health and its politics, it, addressed, uh, it interested me because I was thinking about the history of the evolution of ideas and institutions. I work on the politics of development, and for me, sustainable development at its core has an intellectual lineage in the politics of development. And very briefly, over the next 15, 20 minutes, that is really what I'd like to share with you, because I think um, when we look at sustainable development, especially when I look at it from someone who comes from the global south, there's constantly the politics of development that stares at your face. There are certain kinds of polarities and fissures of development, which I think is an inheritance that, that was debated and discussed in the 1980s when sustainable development began to be framed. But I don't think there's any way that we can think at the, as, the, as of the field either as a discipline or as a field of practice, or even more remotely so to think of it as an arena of policy advocacy, unless we acknowledge the politics which underlie sustainable development. And um, as we all know, sustainable development as a worldview and as a global commitment emerged with the Brundtland Report in 1987. It aimed to address the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And I'm repeating this really because as a historian, it interested me that it speaks both about the present as well as the future. And for me as a historian, I felt that in 1987, when the Brundtland Report is framed, there's an important past to it. There's an important legacy that it carries in 1987, which I think needs to be brought to the table when we speak of it and we speak and plan about framing it as a discipline. So I felt really that there were two, two things that we need to keep in mind when we think of sustainable development and its historical legacies, which is really the importance of context and conjunctures. What are the ideas, institutions, and social actors that shape the birth of sustainable development, in particular the birth of the politics of development, and what have been the sorts of lasting legacies of, um, of the emergence of a discipline and a field that's emerged really uh, in the context of the churning that happened, I think, ideologically in the 1980s, at the time when the Brundtland Report comes into place. But the institutional and the ideological legacies are very much of the politics of the 1970s and 80s. The 1970s and 80s, as many of you may know, were the decades were called the decades of the conference. And uh, when you read some of the development literature at that time and correspondence in the United Nations, and most of my work consists of archiving in the UN, looking at um, looking at the correspondence between many development experts, everyone was whizzing somewhere or the other to, to a conference. So in 1972, you have the World Conference on Environment in Stockholm, and then people were going off to Bucharest, and then Mexico, and round and round and round. And the reason I illustrate this, really, is to say that what happened at Stockholm and what happens really at Bucharest or at any of the other sites, we're not divorced from each other. I don't think you can look at what happened in 1987 or 1988 um, as being divorced from the sorts of other meetings that the UN specialized agencies were holding at that point of time. And my work recently in the WHO archive, as well as in the other UN archive, increasingly led, increasingly led me to believe that the Economic and Social Council of the UN, which was the central body, really, which was sort of the high priest um, mediating all these conferences had experts that went across all of these conferences and there were similar ideas and politics that were being reflected and the same sorts of people were catching the planes to go across to these conferences and back and forth. So it's really important to keep in mind that what 
what, what happens in the Brun, uh, with the Brundtland Commission is also reflective of the general context of politics at that point of time. So in the 1980s, there really was um, the debates about a new and emerging worldview. I think the 1980s really were characterized by three very weighty concerns. There was a past, which is the legacy of development-focused aspirations, which I'll briefly get into. There was also the present in terms of the failures of modernization and development in the 1980s. And the third, really, was the vision of the risks of a common future and the role of experts and social actors, really, beyond the state. And all of these three anxieties about the past, as well as the world economic crisis in the 70s and 80s, and the sense of what was the future and what was the risks of a future, really motivated the debates at that point of time. The first, uh, in the 1950s, as many of us know, um, development and its visions in Asia and Africa began to proliferate. The visions of development in the 1950s represented the power, really, of the idea of development. There was the promise of a kind of modern life, of improved standards of living, and I'm speaking really of Asia and Africa at this point of time in the years of decolonization. And development represented all the promise of what could be done to really achieve and catch up with the West. And there's a wonderful quotation that uh, when Nehru and uh, Julius Nairere from Tanzania and all of them meet at Bandung, at the Bandung Conference, which is really the non-aligned conference, and at various other conferences in the 1950s, there's this vision of really wanting to catch up. And Nairere eventually writes a biography where he says, we must run while they walk. And uh, this really, I think, characterizes the entire sort of, if you have to look at the aspirations that lay behind development, which was to see development as a kind of linear path and a, a process of modernization that was linear and where developing countries could possibly catch up with the West and possibly catch up with them in 50 years as to what they were doing in 150 years. And to briefly diverge, I think this still resonates with me because when, um, at the moment I work on population aging, and when I think of how I go to policymakers in India and I say we have a demographic transition and we have a kind of crisis coming up, they constantly say, but then this is the successes of public health. This is the kind of development we wanted to achieve. So how can development have these two phases? How can we have, you know, how can we have extended the lives of our populations and how can suddenly people come up to us and say aging is a problem and a crisis? So all of this really dates back to the sorts of planning and vision that emerged in the 1950s. And I think there is that kind of hubris of wanting to achieve, to conquer infectious disease, um, to industrialize and modernize that really is reflected in the politics in the uh, 1950s. And since um, keeping Patricia in mind and keeping some of the engineers in mind, I found this uh, wonderful quotation which reminded me of the politics in India, even now, even when I was growing up in the 1980s and 90s, which is really, um, when you think of development and modernization, who was the sort of icon, who was the sort of you know, we had no poets and prophets in developing countries. The engineer, really. Where is the engineer who can build a project out of 80 million human lives, a project that can nourish them, sustain them, and yet have their voluntary lo loyalty? And this is Richard uh, Wright, um, an engineer in Indonesia, who's speaking of the sorts of promises of development that could possibly happen in developing countries. And soon enough, as we know, by the 1970s and 80s, many of these promises were, were sort of turning very sour. And uh, there was both the promise and peril of development. You had state-led development projects that were coming apart. And as many of the Latin American economists wrote in these years, there was really the failure of the development decades. And uh, the promises of what decolonization offered, the sorts of uh, technical assistance programs, all went into a crisis. And there were low growth rates, there was inflation. And when you look at the archival records in the 1970s and 80s in the UN, this, you almost don't, you, you can constantly hear the echoes in the 1980s when sustainable development, debates about population control are being voiced. You constantly hear this issue of who are the dependent populations? Whom are we going to support? What are the responsibilities of welfare state? These are the kind of social concerns that were emerging, that were emerging in the 1980s when this economic crisis was emerging. And developing countries were, I think, less than willing really to engage or have truck with development again. So to really 
sum up my argument, I think this is a good place to do this, maybe, maybe after the next slide, when I, um, when I have these two quotations from Mehboob ul Haq as well as Rafael Salas, who you know, really voiced the sorts of discontent with, um, with both population pro uh, control programs as well as poverty eradication programs that existed at that point of time. And Mehboob ul Haq writes, when you rip aside the confusing figures on growth rates, you find that for at least two-thirds of humanity, the increase in income has been less than $1 a year for the last 20 years. And in terms of technology, Rafael Salas, who was trying to introduce a whole lot of innovation within the UN Population Fund in these years, he says that the family planning campaigns are really falling apart, and they're falling apart in developing countries in the 70s and 80s, they're falling apart simply because of an emphasis on birth control and not really looking at wider social factors. So what happens really in the 80s then is that um, with, with the sorts of crises that are happening in terms of development, you also have, the, you have a kind of response in terms of um, the rise of certain kinds of expertise. And my work also spans the, the sorts of development expertise that emerged in the 1980s. There were transnational epistems of technical experts who really began to mobilize because there was a kind of discontent about what the state could achieve. And it's at this point in the 1980s that um, the promise of development hours, and you have the sense that the, it's possible really to ally both society and the environment and to be looking at sustainable development as a kind of, um, it's, I would even, I mean, to borrow Samuel Moyne's words, I could even say it's a kind of, it was a it was sort of rebirth of a kind of utopia in a sense. You could see development, but you could also see the rebirth of development. And I would say that in the 1980s, what happens when sustainable development is conceptualized is not so much to articulate a new ethic as much as to reopen the debate about development and to be able to say these are the problems we've had over the past few decades and can we look at these actors again and we, can we look at the inequities between these actors again. And th this is the time really and I thought the example of demography is important to bring up um, in, in the post-war decades because demography emerges then as a discipline that begins to reach out and uh, also take so to sort of ally itself with the sorts of promises of modernity, of seeing a sort of linear pathway of what birth control measures could offer. And this is the sort of, the, the new disciplines that came up after the post-war really have to be associated with the sorts of um, the, the programs that, were, that, were, that they were associated with uh, within the 1970s and 80s. So what the point I'm trying to make here is that both with public health and demography in the 1970s and 80s, we need to ask the question about when disciplines are developing and taking on new paradigms in the 70s and 80s, whom are they speaking to? Who are the people who are financing these disciplines? And when we think of the growth of disciplines and the stages through which they go through, I think it's, it's crucial to really ask these questions because both demography as well as public health, especially population politics, were deeply mired in the politics of what's happening in the 1970s and 80s. And finally, the last couple of questions I wanted to raise really is that it's important when we understand sustainable development to really not essentialize what it is, that uh, to almost not think of sustainable development as having an inherent nature or essence which, uh, which relates itself to the limits of growth, but to really understand what are the values and interests, what are the sorts of intellectual practices that have pr produced sustainable development. And um, also to, to look back at the 1980s as the period which produced certain kinds uh, which, which constructed very sort of ambivalent and flexible and fluid boundaries around sustainable development. So its sustainable development is, um, needs to be really seen in terms of um, who, who addressed sustainable development and what are, the sorts of, what are the sorts of audiences it addressed itself to. And what resonated with me as a person who works in public health is that it reminded me in a way of the evolution of a subdiscipline, the subdiscipline of global health. Because global health comes up as this sort of big new idea in the early, 19, uh, well, in the early 1990s, but the idea begins to be articulated in the late 1980s when there's a sense really that um, the hubris which was associated with the conquest of infectious diseases has been set aside. There's a sort of alliance of both public health and health security that comes together. And the first global health schools begin to be really founded in the US. And uh, again, you see a discipline which is founded in particular, cent but, you know, which has a particular geography which is founded in certain parts of the world and begins to try to understand um, 
other, other, other um, public health in terms of what's happening in various other parts in terms of um, the challenges to public health which is arising in what many people have termed as the periphery. So I think these debates are important to keep in mind and it's also important to keep in mind that sustainable development eventually has to be judged and understood in terms of what are the politics that made it up. And there was a very, very important, there's an important le legacy of development politics that really dogs sustainable development. And it's very important to not turn away from it simply because we think of it is an arena which is an arena of policy, which is an arena of advocacy, and uh, policy and advocacy both need certain kinds of generalizability as a field. And I think as a historian, uh, it's very important for me to see certain kinds of specificities, and it's very important therefore to see what this tension is within sustainable development itself, within as being both a field of generalizability as well as a field of specificity. And I think these two things really need to be tied together when we, when we debate and discuss sustainable development. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm uh, Bob Pollack. I'm a troglodyte throwback, and I'm going to try and talk without PowerPoint. I want to thank Trish and Kavita. Um, it's good that I come after Kavita because it will look as if we had actually planned this, but we didn't. Um, so I have, uh, I have the following to say. I think it'll take me 20 minutes or less. I, I, we're here to better understand, as I, as I see it, the dynamics of the emergence of a new academic field, sustainable development. And I'm not an expert on the sociology of academic subject demarcations, but I have been around a long time as a scientist so perhaps the experience I have to share with you will shed some light on what we're facing and will have to face as we go forward. I studied physics and math as an undergraduate here. My reasons were neither deeply intellectual nor career-oriented. My parents were poor, and Columbia's tuition of $400 a semester loomed over them and me as a possible barrier to my attending. When the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the New York State response included a doubling of the region's scholarship for winners who had promised to major in the hard sciences or engineering. So I set aside my dream of writing and I majored in physics. So did about a third of the entering class of 1961 here, but most of the rest of my classmates figured out in short order that no one was tracking them. So we graduated in 1961 with the usual hundreds of pre-meds and hundreds of pre-laws and only nine, as I recall, nine physics majors, myself in the middle of that pack. I knew no post-high school biology beyond what I learned from my pre-med friends. They were learning their biology in the zoology and botany departments here. Those two departments were the ancestors of the Botanic Garden and the Zoological Society of New York. They were merged into the current Department of Biological Sciences well after I graduated. Then, much of what passed for zoology was still descriptive. It was what my physics friends and I called stamp collecting. The same was not true of the chemistry that pre-meds needed to know, organic chem in particular, nor of the physics they needed. Both were of much more general significance, and because of that, both were quite divorced from their biology courses in content and in scope. I also understood that there was a big deal that had happened some five or 10 years earlier, the discovery by Watson and Crick in 1953 that a chemical called DNA had interesting properties which made it a candidate to be the vehicle of genetic inheritance. That's what led me to apply to Brandeis University's new graduate program in biophysics, biochemistry, and biology. That program promised to uncover by experimental design the promise of DNA. That is, that biological characteristics could be traced to physical and chemical causes, and that disprovable, testable models could encompass the seemingly impossible complexity of the living world. That promise, and another, an NIH training grant that allowed them to offer me a stipend as well as remission of tuition, brought me to Brandeis. The key insight of that new PhD program was not technical but aesthetic. It was the insistence that a genetics question could best be answered only if one took the very simplest of systems to study it. This minimalist approach had emerged from the work of a small group of emigre physicists and chemists who had come to this country as fascism and Nazism overran their countries in the middle third of the last century. 
Two of these, Salvador Luria and Max Delbruck, pretty much established the field, the new field of molecular genetics all by themselves. Their application of the aesthetic was to study the patterns of inheritances of viruses that grew in bacteria. These viruses were genetically and chemically orders of magnitude simpler than their host bacteria, which were, of course, millions of times smaller than a single cell of any plant or animal big enough to see. They studied the emergence and the growth of a bacterium with resistance to a virus or resistance to a drug. They quickly showed that such genetically stable resistance was not induced by a drug's or a virus's presence, but rather was the result of a constant accumulation of genetic variation in a cloned population of bacteria, with the subsequent selection for the variant as the only subpopulation capable of survival under the new circumstances of a drug or a virus being present. This discovery brought the work of Darwin 100 years earlier, into sharp molecular focus at the very smallest scales of life. Taken together, Luria Delbruck and Darwin meant that the simplest explanation for any inherited difference appearing in any population over time would be the emergence of a random genetic variant, a new DNA sequence arising by an error in copying, followed by the overgrowth of the variant when a new sequence provided a greater chance of survival under the specific conditions in which it found itself. My career as a molecular biologist began early in the life of the field. In, with my demonstration in 1967 that proper constructive of such selective conditions could permit the isolation in cell culture of genetically reverted normal tissue cells from a clone of lethally malignant cancer cells. Revertants of this sort were not induced by any agent, but arose by the same sort of error-driven genetic variation. In this case, the variant re-expressed normal growth control, and that spared it from a drug that killed all its malignant relatives. The next step, then, was obvious, to isolate revertants and compare the DNA of them with their malignant relatives, and thereby find genes for reversion. Then to understand how such genes, you might perhaps be able to domesticate a tumor instead of trying to kill it. But at that time in the late 60s and early 70s, there were no tools for isolating and sequencing stretches of DNA from cells as there are now. So as a practical matter, I was reduced to explicating my initial insight in a string of papers to confirm and extend my work and to keep my lab going and funded first at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, then at Stony Brook Medical School, and then in 1978 back here in Columbia. As the new technologies of recombinant DNA and DNA sequencing emerged, I found myself running a lab that was keeping up, but really not able to follow through on the promise of that earlier work. That situation ground to a halt in terms of my running a lab in the early 1990s after a seven-year stint here as the Dean of Columbia College, when I decided to follow up my old interest in writing, in this case about a set of problems that involved subjective emotional states as well as facts of nature. But I have never left this field, and I'm happy to say that today many labs and also many companies are searching the genomes of normal, malignant, and revertant cells for the DNA sequence differences that encode the small RNAs and other regulatory molecules, which may be responsible for maintaining the revertant state. My point for the purpose of today, though, is to note that regardless of its funding source, most of this work that began as molecular biology is now connected with what is called translational research. In other words, it is being carried out in the hopes of selling a patent once preliminary results makes a sequence particularly interesting. In that sense, it is no longer molecular biology at all as its founders understood the notion. That field's first golden stake, in geological terms, went in in the 1960s, marked by the merger of zoology and botany into biology, of biology and chemistry into biochemistry, and the merger of them all into molecular biology. Then the second stake bookended the field in the 90s with the emergence of translational research. A confirming way to understand this 
to see the emergence and passing of molecular biology as a field is to look at the history of the publication of a textbook, the textbook, The Molecular Biology of the Gene. In the first edition by Jim Watson himself, it came out in 1967, and it codified for the first time what departments of chemistry, zoology, botany, biology, and biochemistry already knew, that is, that DNA and its properties had changed the intersect of their fields forever. That edition went through many printings until the second edition came out in 1970. The rate of change in the field pushed Watson to a third edition in half the time in 1976. By then, though, molecular biology itself was already beginning to speciate. We can see this by the fact that it took a decade before the third edition emerged, and when it did, it had fissioned, it had split into two volumes. The first volume was another update of the original by Jim Watson, but the second was a commentary and compendium of wholly new technologies by him, along with four of his acolytes from MIT and the Ivies. Nancy Hopkins, one of those four, had been a postdoc in my lab. You will perhaps know of her as the MIT professor who got her president to pay the same salaries to women as to men faculty. The fifth edition in 2003 was also in two volumes, the second one now written by three lesser scientists and was far more replete with new applications than with new ideas. The sixth and last edition to date came out in 2007, no sign of any more to come. So we can say the textbook spikes of this era of molecular biology, per se, went in at 67 and at 2007, a longer period but no more than 40 years. The book, in its many iterations by Watson himself at first, and even when elaborated with the contributions of many others, defined a field, the field of molecular biology for that period. It brought together the physics of energy conservation and information quantification, the chemistry of the exchange of kinetic for potential energy of covalent bonds, the biochemistry of enzymatic construction of complex molecules with, for the first time, the classic genetics of Mendel, the virus and bacterial genetics of Delbruck and Luria, and the crystallography of double helical DNA and of the hugely complex proteins and RNAs. In the latter half of those 40 years, recombinant DNA technology, informatics, cheap DNA sequencing technology, powerful parallel processors of digital information, and pattern recognition algorithms had all grown from the molecular biology, which was to understand genetic transfer of information at the molecular level. These applications then made wholly disparate and incommensurate uses of that initial idea. The field then reconverged for a time in a new understanding wholly different from anything in Watson's text, when these innovations led to the closing of an informational feedback loop by the synthesis and testing of new, unnatural DNA sequences for characteristics of novel genetic identity. With that, molecular biology rapidly speciated in only the past 10 or 20 years into bioinformatics, drug development, rational drug development, forensic science, gene mapping, and the reemergence of embryonic development to be the stage for understanding the construction and genetic complexity of our own bodies. That, in turn, recently speciated again into stem cell research, assisted reproductive technology, and the creation of transgenic species hybrids. The ancestral species of science encoded in molecular biology of the gene is now a fossil of interest to historians and scientists of a certain age, but no longer the subject of many grants or companies, nor even of one freestanding course. So, a few implications. First, ideas matter, and they matter quickly. You will appreciate, I'll bet, that the notion of speciation of a field in a decade, with a species lifetime for that field then measured also in decades, is a play on Darwinian DNA-based natural selection, but it speeds the process by about 10 to the fifth fold. That's not a coincidence. 
as the one thinking, self-aware, social species capable of abstract symbolic thought, we are increasing in numbers at a rate many fold faster than any other species our size. We are using up carbon sources that took 10 to the nine years to lay down in less than 10 to the three years, an even greater relative velocity of mental over physical processes. Not even a decade has passed since the faculty of the Earth Institute here began to consider itself enough of a faculty in the classic sense to create its own curriculum for undergraduates and graduate students. Making ideas that matter stay for longer than a few decades is the challenge we face in dealing with the idea of sustainable development. Second, we can predict from the experience I've described that as the field of sustainable development emerges, its success will raise the likelihood of its being subsumed and overcome by new fields based on its insights but no longer committed to its agenda. To my eye, we're not there yet, but the speciating horizon can be seen. Third, unlike molecular biology, we still lack a single textbook for this field. And more importantly, we also lack a single informing insight into nature or society that has withstood testing well enough to justify confidence that we are on the right track in our own expectations. What, after all, have we got to tell our colleagues and our students and each other, let alone our more distant colleagues in chemistry, engineering, physics, philosophy, computer science, economics, history, political science, earth science, biology, psychology, anthropology, that has the scope and depth of Watson's mechanism of semi-conservative replication linked to Mendel's data? Fourth and finally, we should ask ourselves whether, like the zoologists and botanists of the 1950s who ignored Watson's discovery in their tenure, we might be ignoring a model, an insight, an idea that would in fact bring us together as a new field. The current science that has emerged from what began 50 years ago as the new field of molecular biology does have something to contribute to our discussion of this final question. We've learned a great deal in the past decade about what each of us is capable of as a thinking individual. We have assembled a rich database of human DNA variation. We are beginning to understand how those capabilities we have are expressed in molecular terms through the interaction of encoded and inherited ge genetic information with experience-driven modulation of that information in our bodies and brains. Though the neurobiology of consciousness is in its earliest stages, we already can conclude that the social barriers of language and economic development, what Professor Jim Cohn has called the maldistribution of suffering, are not in our genes. Rather, they occur within a species population of seven billion, all of whom share the same capacity for thought, for feelings, and for making choices based on ideas and feelings as well as instinct. Put another way, we are beginning to understand the genetic differences between us and all other species, and we are finding that our ancient notions of free will are surviving molecular mechanistic analysis. Molecular biology in its short life has thereby given us the green light to pursue an agenda for the new field of sustainable development which would be to model the diminishment of the maldistribution of suffering in a new language of ideas that can and would be shared with and understood by not only ourselves and our students and our colleagues, but also in principle by all seven billion other beings with whom we share a human genome. Here's this idea articulated in 1978, the same era that Kavita talked about and that I began my career in, by Václav Havel, who stood up to the Soviet controllers of his country when it was the CSSR, that is, the Czech Soviet Socialist Republic. In his essay, The Power of the Powerless, he wrote, if a better economic and political model is to be created, then perhaps more than ever before it must derive from profound existential and moral changes in society. This is not something that can be designed and introduced 
like a new car. If it is to be more than just a new variation of the old degeneration, it must above all be an expression of life in the process of transforming itself. A better system will not automatically assure a better life. In fact, the opposite is true. Only by creating a better life can a better system be developed. If that were our guiding idea, I suspect we would be seeing our new field become defined as one that learns not only from its practitioners, but also from its subjects. And that, to me, would be the beginning of an agenda for a new field of just and sustainable development. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Kavita. Thank you, Bob, for setting the stage. I sincerely hope that we are not following as a field, as a community, as a discipline, the fate of molecular biology. biology. And I think there are, there are two reasons to believe that this might not be the case. One, I think the scope of the problem and the time scale it will take and the, the time scale over which it will be with us, I think is longer than it takes to solve some of the problems that molecular biology did very successfully in a fairly short period of time. And uh, so, so in, in a sense, I think the uh, field discipline of molecular biology fell victim as a, as, a, as a discipline. Of course, it left a lot of traces in science for the future, but it fell victim to its own success. And uh, I, I doubt that we will, we will be, exactly, I, I, I doubt we will be as successful in, in uh, our endeavor to deal with questions of sustainable development. So I will not deal too much with the past except going back to the Brundtland definition, but try to discuss, and it's really a, a work in progress. I have no real answer, firm answer to the question, are we a discipline or are we a field, are we an emerging discipline? Um, but I will try to lay out some thoughts around which we could um, think about where we are, what our task is, where we might go, what we might need, and in which form we can accomplish that. So as uh, Kavita already uh, said, uh, Brundtland defined sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's a, a very big scope, not very specific in how you do that, but nevertheless, it, it gave a lot of people a lot to think about. And uh, it, it, of course, was not the first time that we were, as a society, as a, as a scientific community, challenged to think about the future of the planet, including its inhabitants. But if you think about the Club of Rome, the limits of growth, if you think about Rachel Carson's uh, book, Silent Spring, there, there were several attempts in the past to draw our attention to the issue that we are not living in an environment that has uh, limitless resources. So the motivation to discuss sustainable development, I think, are manifolds, and I'm just listing a few, and I might skip over a few that I have on the slides. Um, so if we, if we look at the past three centuries, roughly, the world population has increased by a factor of about 10. We crossed, according to UN uh, census, the 7 billion mark. Uh, Bob already mentioned that. Energy use increased by a factor of 16 in the 20th century alone. And that uh, increased, uh, of course, the greenhouse gas concentration, but also other substances of the atmosphere, such as sulfur dioxide and acid rain that's uh, combined uh, to it, or related to it. About 30 to 50 percent of the Earth's surface is used by humans, anthropogenically uh, changed. And that, that includes uh, ocean. Everybody has heard about the uh, destruction of rainforest, which not only is a problem for species uh, extinction, but also contributes to the CO2 increase in the atmosphere. Fisheries use more than 25% in upwelling regions to 35% in, 
in shelf regions in moderate latitudes of the oceanic primary production. So we are actually harvesting a lot of what the planet can produce in terms of biomass. And uh, last example, the amount of nitrogen fertilizer which is used in agriculture is larger than the nitrogen naturally fixed by all global ecosystems. So we are, we are mining into Earth's resources. Now, these effects, and the, this is just a small example of, of a long list of how we have managed to impact our planet, were caused by only about one quarter of the world population. And if we are projecting that forward, if we would go along the same trajectory, the uh, effects of, of human activity on the planet would, would be um, accordingly much bigger. The consequences, as already mentioned, include global warming, acid rain, smog, just to name a few. And in fact, the role of humans in the Earth system by now is so large that a new geological unit of time, the so-called Anthropocene, has been proposed by people like uh, Krutzen, a nobelist in, uh, in chemistry, or Salasiewicz. So what kind of challenge that does, does this pose now for academia? We, we see these effects playing out around us. We see that certain components of our planet, I mean, and we have to keep in, in mind that, of course, there's always evolution uh, on, on the planet. But there seem to be some perturbations or, or some part of the evolution are so out of balance that we, we are facing uh, serious changes of some of the systems we depend upon. Now, for, for academia, it, it pretty much the, the uh, recognition that our natural and, and socio-economic, socio-cultural systems are on a non-sustainable path rep represent one of the biggest challenges for humankind, and I think that's for the foreseeable future. That, that, brought me to the comment to, to Bob's um, example of uh, molecular biology. I have a hard time seeing that go away over a period of decades or even a few centuries. I think that's something that will be with us from here on out. Now, academia, of course, is the most fundamental generator of knowledge and new ideas of society. And so there is an ethical and moral obligation of academia to respond to these challenges. And there are not only challenges, there are also opportunities in uh, facing such a situation. But it also raises the question of defining the position of sustainable development within academia. What is it? Is it an activity? Is it a field? Is it a discipline? So if we're looking at Columbia University and the position of the Earth Institute, which was the response of the university to that set of challenges that we are facing, we can say that, and this is something that uh, goes back to former wise uh, executive provost Mike Crow, who is now the president of uh, ASU, Arizona State University, who said there is a natural development in academia starting with uh, cultural core-driven components like arts and sciences core, they deal with civilization and culture, quality of life-driven components, such as, for example, the health sciences, which deal, in this case, clearly with human health, professional schools, which address economic and social needs of society and provide professional education, and now reaching the point where we have to think about the sustainability of our planet, which goes into the area of global citizenship and is done at Columbia through the Earth Institute. The question that I framed there in red is, what is the underlying definition of that activity, and is it really a new discipline? So we then can ask the question, why should it be a, a new academic discipline, sustainable development I, I'm talking about? So the answer could, could be that the questions that we are faced with, if we are talking about sustainable development, are too big to be addressed between existing disciplines or by any of the existing disciplines. The knowledge base that is required for studies in sustainable development has to be developed in a dedicated effort and, and be refined. It's, it's a, a 
flexible uh, entity and construct. And I'm now referring mainly to, to research. But in order to do that, I think we have to train a new generation of scientists who have the capacity and capability to analyze and address problems in sustainable development, which leads to an educational component, very consistent with the mandate of an academic institution. But in addition to many of the uh, activities that academia took on, I think sustainable development has a, a, a very immediate need to transfer the knowledge that it has gathered into the stakeholder domain. And here I speak in, in a broad sense of stakeholders, including academia itself, but also the private sector, decision makers, uh, and so on, and, and society at large, of course. So I think that requires a sustained, focused effort to develop research, education, and practice uh, agendas for sustainable development. Now let's see how academic disciplines are typically defined and, and see how, how our agenda actually matches to that. So one uh, quote is that a discipline is a branch of learning or knowledge. The word is generally reserved for a subject that is well established, has recognizable methodology associated with it. And in this particular case, uh, examples are given, saying, for example, science, mathematics, and philosophy are disciplines. French, social studies, and drama are not. Now, you, you can debate that. I'm not saying that I'm agreeing with that, but that, that is what you, what you find if you're looking for definitions. Another um, quote says, uh, disciplines of knowledge. Uh, on the surface, it refers to a body or domain of knowledge where precision of meaning and depth of analysis are achieved by the use of distinctive concepts. And I think that, that's important to keep in mind. More basically, a discipline such as history, so here actually it, it, it's uh, counted philosophy or physics, can be seen as activity committed to the refinement or extension of knowledge in accordance with conventions about how intellectual inquiry should be conducted and its outcomes evaluated. So that, that's important, that, that last part that's highlighted in red, that we have to develop a matrix for success. In addition to the um, you know, well-defined body of knowledge and the, the specific methods that are used. So let's see why are new disciplines actually created? What are the reasons for new disciplines? Again, one quote says, the industrial revolution of the late 18th century began to stimulate a demand for higher education from a rapidly expanding industrial and commercial middle class. Another quote also uh, re, uh, sort of going into that direction says, the re revolution within the universities belatedly reflected the revolution in society at large. So pretty much saying we are following the needs of society when we are thinking about new disciplines. And you could say civil engineering actually had a component of that. The Industrial Revolution had created a larger size, more complex society based on great cities and requiring a wider range of expert services. So that's when a lot of the professional schools were created, like engineering schools, schools of public health, architecture, journalism, and so on. So, so pretty much following the need for a broader set of knowledge that serves an evolving society. Here's an interesting one. Some subjects gained admission into the college course not by descending from a respected ancestor, like molecular biology did, but by overcoming an initially ignoble reputation, which you could say sustainable development has. Let us call it the process of subject dignification. And they give some examples which go to the, the first, more rigid definition of, uh, of that, that I brought up for, for disciplines, saying, you know, English actually was accepted as a discipline in the first half of the 1700s, French in the second half. Not sure why there is this uh, sequence, but people might have thoughts about that. And in 1819, Harvard grants first, uh, the, the first American professorship in modern means life languages. And then late 1840s, applied science and engineering you know, came into, into being. So here I have some thoughts on the emergence of new disciplines. 
and um, citing from from a paper by uh, two um, Portuguese scientists, it says a new paradigm is adjusted. It, so there, there are three steps. A new paradigm is adjusted to cover the various manifestations of the emerging collab collaborative forms. Second one is the consolidated set of basic knowledge is organized. That goes a bit to what uh, Trish said about the body of knowledge that fields develop. And third, which I think is important, the, the various multidisciplinary researchers involved in this work start to identify themselves as members of this new community rather than experts doing research on collaborative networks while staying as members of their original communities and disciplines. So it really means that you have to move into new intellectual uh, spaces. So what would that paradigm be? I would say for sustainable development, the new paradigm is the need for a holistic study of, Earth system, of the Earth system, including humans in the Anthropocene. So if we are then looking at, at, if we assume that sustainable development can be defined as a discipline, what would it do and how would it do it? What would be the subject? How, what would be the method? and uh, how would we measure it? I would say that in very general terms, we, we could say that sustainable development is the study of the Anthropocene and its impact on Earth's finite and renewable resources as well as, as its uh, habitability. The underlying methodology is to understand, predict, and modify complex systems, which means we would be able to analyze future states of the Earth system in the context of sustainable development and do that in a transdisciplinary fashion, which means creating true new intellectual spaces. I think if we would accept that, we also have to, to accept that uh, sustainable development is similar to professional school in its mandate, which means it's there to find solutions to specific societal needs with immediate impact, and, and in that sense, it's an, it's an applied science. That mandate, in my view, only can be fulfilled on the foundation of sustained excellence in existing disciplines, which means we are not trying to substitute any ex existing discipline, but we are trying to create space for intellectual activities that cannot be driven or occupied or solved by the existing set of, of disciplines. Sustainable development deals with complex problems that emerge in many forms in different application domains and consist of many facets whose proper understanding requires the contribution from multiple disciplines. So it, it really has to sit within those, uh, not coming out of one or being pressed into an existing one. One could say that, in fact, various aspects of sustainable development have been studied by different branches of science, including earth environmental science, other natural sciences, social sciences, humanities, basically most of the spectrum of academic disciplines. Now, the acceptance here, is a, that's a practical issue, the acceptance of a new discipline is not a specific uh, process because the established sciences and paradigms tend to resist the introduction of another quote-unquote competitor and rather prefer to extend the existing sciences or fields and their associated rules to explain the new phenomena. And I would say that in our case that might hold us back rather than accelerate our ability to find solutions to the problems that we are facing. So let me sum up to here quickly and say, based on, on these sort of definitions, hypotheses, and problem definition, I would say that sustainable development actually should be its own discipline, and we have to find a way to establish that. Now let's see where we are with the Earth Institute, and I try to keep that short because many of you know most of that, but I, I just want to see how these things would actually hang together. So if you're looking at the mission, and I'm just picking out a few of that, it's the integrated study of Earth and its environment, human society and the interactions of, uh, between the two. 
It's based on excellence in its basic disciplines. And in the present mission, which we are working on, uh, on, in, uh, on updating, the basic disciplines are earth sciences, biological sciences, engineering sciences, social sciences, and the health sciences, not including the humanities yet at that, in this particular write-up. Stresses cross-disciplinary innovation. It also immobilizes science and technology to address the complex environmental issues, highlighting sustainable development and the needs of the world's poor. Now you might wonder how the needs of the world's poor comes into that. You could argue that we never can be uh, sustainable if we cannot equalize uh, the, or if we cannot um, remove that strong gradient between the ones who have and the ones who don't have. Our definition of sustainable development has a strong component of the Brundtland definition. It reads, sustainable development signifies the ability of the world to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor, and the ability of all to pursue further progress in overall human well-being. That was particularly chosen to offset it against what often is meant under um, you know, de development, which means economic uh, development and economic well-being. So we really would like to, to extend that. The world as a whole and each major sub-region ought to be able to accomplish these goals without irreparable harm to vital ecosystems, depletion of essential resources, or unjustifiable risk to future generations. So you, you can see the handwriting of the Brundtland definition, but there are some important uh, additions to it. And you know, you could. Th this is something that is uh, always evolving and and will will be evolving as we move forward. Now this is a complex um, figure, but I just want to, to highlight a few elements of it. So if you say, why, why do we have sustainable development in academia, and, and what is it supposed to do? The reason, of course, is that we do have increasing pressure, which is the upper left box, uh, to, uh, on, the, on the Earth system due to human activities, and we are getting a bit out of balance between the components in the Earth system. And so we, we need to understand these uh, systems and find solutions to the problem of overdevelopment of the planet. How will we do that? We, we ha in, in order to be successful at all, we have to develop the capacity to project future states of the Earth system under varying development scenarios. Otherwise, we just cannot plan ahead. If we cannot get to that point, we really cannot uh, you know, intelligently talk about sustainable development. And then we also have to assess how sustainable these future states are and try to move towards them compared to those that are deemed not, not as uh, sustainable. As I already mentioned, there has to be an interplay between research activities, education activities, and, and practice. So if we look at the research side of, of things, we have a strong tie to departments, and typically the departments are doing a lot of uh, basic research, but some of them also are engaging in, in applied research. We have what we call the Earth Institute units. A lot of them are doing basic research. There are components of interdisciplinary research. We have what we call the cross-cutting initiative. That is an initiative that tries to bind all these different uh, fields together and, and sort of develop a, a, a sphere for transdisciplinary research. And then we have uh, what is called uh, cross-cutting centers that are focused on themes, take integrated approaches, and uh, they are only separated out by themes for operational re re reasons. There is a, a mechanism that keeps them closely linked together to achieve a holistic approach to, to many questions that need it. So this picture only is up there to show you how many centers we have within the Earth Institute. So if you are looking at, the, uh, at this picture, um, from top to bottom, you pretty much see how long individual centers existed. And then on the, uh, uh, on the bottom, the uh, x-axis is a time scale. So some of the centers that are now part of the Earth Institute preceded the Earth Institute in, in their uh, uh, creation. But some, most of them are actually uh, have been founded as uh, a consequence of the Earth Institute uh, Earth Institute's need. We have roughly 35 operational centers right now that deal with different parts of the, uh, of the problem of sustainable, de sustainable development, and they span from 
basic science to applied science to social science. Um, I think I would actually claim in some of them we have elements of the humanities, although it's underdeveloped and, and not yet um, fully expressed. If we are looking at the educational side, we have a full set of programs. We have an undergraduate special concentration and a major. In the, in the college, in the School of General Studies, we have a PhD in sustainable development, and then we have uh, professional master's uh, programs, for example, the uh, MPA in Environmental Science and Policy, Master of Science in Climate and uh, Society, that's actually a mistake, should be a Master of Arts, an MPA in Development Practice, um, Master of Science in Sustainability Management, and under development, a Master's in Carbon Management. And in the in orange colors, you see how they were, were phased in over a period of uh, more than a decade. So here you can get a sense of what the uh, entrance into these programs is, and the different colors show the different programs. So in general, some of them, like the MPA in Environmental uh, Science and Policy, has reached a quasi-plateau, quasi-steady state. Others are still growing fairly rapidly. We also engage in practice. And here I'm just showing a few uh, examples which are um, for, for practice work that is done primarily through the Earth Clinic but also uh, outside that structure. There are issues that deal with arsenic contamination in Bangladesh and its impact on, on uh, human health. There are things like um, a program in, in uh, subsidized cook stoves in sub-Saharan Africa because that's a big uh, public health problem. There are some more eclectic uh, things like transportation in Africa and here particularly the exploration of bamboo bicycles as uh, sustainable transportation and pastoral education in Dirtu, etc. So real prop, uh, really uh, ish, uh, programs that take what we learn in academia out into the world, see if it works. If it works, it will be handed off. If it doesn't work, it will be brought back in and will be re-examined. Uh, we have created, and I think Bob already, uh, already referred to that, and a group of faculty that underpins these activities. It's about 45 faculty members now that uh, are responsible for the academic governance of the institute. Their appointments are coterminous with their home department appointments. It's a rapidly growing body, which I will show in a, in a moment, and uh, all of these appointments are joint appointments. Here you can see how we held this group steady at uh, a number of uh, 11 for a long period of time, up to 2004. And this, this was simply a political decision from those who ran the institute at the time. And then starting in around 2005, we said we really have to be more inclusive. We have to live up to our own goal of uh, being able to treat problems in a holistic way. So we are now at 45. The different colors basically tell you regular members and associate members ex officio, which, which doesn't really matter for the purpose of this discussion. And these are drawn from 20 different departments or schools. So it's a very, very diverse um, set of intellects and, and allows to, to treat problems of all kinds of complexities uh, in, a, in a holistic way. This just shows that, you know, it is drawn from different fields and you can see that we are still sort of in the process of balancing between these fields. Earth science for reasons that are specific to Columbia has um, the, the highest number of members but you know we do have members from biological sciences, public health, social sciences, engineering and so on. So let me close with a few perspectives. I would claim that the Earth Institute is on its way towards defining and establishing sustainable development as a new academic discipline. There is still work to be done. This is nothing that has been perfected or has been closed as a thought process or an, an, an operational process. But we have put components in place that will help finishing that process. We have a full educational uh, program we have a wide set of research activities, and we have practice programs that help us to translate our research into the uh, domain outside academia. There's a rapidly growing community of faculty members and research scientists which provide, or who provide, 
the intellectual underpinning and the academic governance, and more and more that goes into a self-governance of, of this group. The permanent position within Columbia University still has to be determined. There is a, an evolution. We are the largest institute, but we are still an institute, and we, we have to uh, make many, many links for all these programs. And some of them actually are really good, so I don't want to see that as a negative. But sometimes, especially in the creation of new intellectual space, you need some independence. And I think we, we really have to work on that, on that aspect. You know, where, where should it be? How should it be uh, done? How does it relate to, to other disciplines so that we keep a good link to the existing base but that we also have the freedom to explore, develop, and occupy new intellectual domains. Uh, with respect to how does, do these things happen, sometimes there's an operational aspect to establishing new disciplines. And you know, societies uh, usually start in, in a national context, but more and more in an international context. So we are exploring an international alliance in sustainable development, and we hope that this will help to bring more mass to the thought process and to the definition and the operational, operationalization of the field. So that's pretty much where I think we, we are standing uh, with respect to the fundamental question of whether or not sustainable development is or is on its way to be an academic discipline and how the US Institute relates to that effort and reflects it, um, promotes it, or uh, benefits from it. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to thank our three speakers, and we're going to spend the next um, 30 minutes of the seminar actually inviting contributions from the audience. I, I hope a lot of the material that was presented here has actually provoked some interesting thoughts and, and can lead to some interesting um, questions and discussions. So I'd like to um, throw the floor out to the audience. We have a microphone and um, this, this idea. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm so sorry, I can't pronounce your last name, but eventually I'll move to India and, and master it. So I'm going to be um, informal and say Kavit. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, um, bringing up the perspective of the participants of the, in the historical evolution of sustainable development and the question that you pose consistently, who is at the table and, uh, and what is being defined and what is the history of the participants at the table. What I tell my colleagues in my community, I'm from this community in Harlem, as I discuss this concept with oh, this, this, this new, this, well, I wouldn't say it's new, I mean that's another important point. Um, but as I discuss this with my local community, and I have some confusion thrown to me, I tend to quote, I say to them, um, if Malcolm X were alive, I believe he would say, the people who polluted the planet are not telling us how they're going to save the planet. Um, and so I throw that out to you, given that you, you constantly, uh, not critically, but it, you've helped uh, stabilize in my mind's eye that uh, the debate that we're having across the planet from the institutions are really, uh, for me, colonialistic and, uh, and, and is a direct response to the decolonization process. Right? And on that note, um, thank you very much, Mr. Slosher. Um, in defining uh, clearly the evolution of the institute as opposed to a, a well-defined department, et cetera, et cetera. But I would pose to you a question, uh, and I hope it's not too political, but I think it has to be raised, is that um, as the curriculum develops in the university, uh, sustainable development, um, where does it interact with the movement of the university in its development of a campus in uh, Harlem Heights and or Manhattanville or how you would define it. I think that that question, I don't think this institute or the university can go forward without clearly interacting with what it's doing as an institution as opposed to what it's teaching within the curriculum and how it constantly goes abroad and talks about Africa and Pakistan, et cetera, et cetera, but in its own backyard, it's, it's mum, it's quiet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'd like you to address that. And again, because you are, quote unquote, setting a pattern of leading and, and, and developing in, in academia across the United States and the world, uh, I would like to have you discuss uh, or address the, 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 uh, the director uh, submitting himself for the, 
the, the head of the World Bank. Uh, you, you know, Dr. Sachs presented himself as the candidate for the World Bank, uh, uh, which he clearly defined in the London Financial Times as a bank of development as opposed to a political entity. And uh, how you see that in, in the discussion of politics of the development institution, the director presenting himself as a, a viable candidate of the World Bank, and, uh, and how will we discuss that in academia and in the community. So thank you. Malcolm X would say, the people who polluted the planet are now telling us how to save it. Two, how does the curriculum address the institution as it moves in West Harlem or Manhattanville, however you define it, and uh, any comments you would make with uh, Dr. Sachs presenting himself in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the consistent debate in the papers around the world on what's going to happen with the, the voting of the, the head of the World Bank. Thank you. So, um I'm not sure, you must correct me if I didn't completely, uh, if I don't straight away answer your, your question, but from what, what I grasped, you were asking me if there were important continuities between, and discontinuities between colonial structures and post-colonial structures when it comes to debates on um, sustainable development. Am I, am I right? Is that... Uh, well, I was saying to you that you, you helped me immensely uh, the way you presented your position yeah. uh, on the, uh, asking who was at the table and who yeah. were the needs of the people. As I see um, the, the discussion, uh, even in, in the projects of the, the units of the Earth Institute, mm -hmm. it's always abroad. It's always in Africa. And, and I, sorry. Just as a matter of fact, um, one center, the one I'm a co-director of, the Center for the Study of Science and Religion, works with Harlem Faith and Justice, works at the Riverside Church, works at Union Theological Seminary, works with the community, has published a map of uh, ecological and environmental high and low quality sites in Harlem and welcomes cooperation with the communities north and south of us uh, on exactly your point. And in the larger point, to take Professor Schlosser's slide at face value, this country and China this year produced um, more than half the carbon dioxide in the planet. And you and I, as citizens of this country, have a citizen's responsibility to think about those consequences. And we share that responsibility regardless of who owns what eminent domain site north of here. And finally, I would like to hope that the university operates ethically as well as legally. But I promise you, the Earth Institute's functions extend to the community as well as the students and faculty here. Are you asking me or are you telling me? I'm a professor, I'm a professor of biology at Columbia and I have absolutely no interaction with Community Board 9. Columbia University Administration does and I have absolutely no idea what those conversations are. Okay, so um, we, let's we, move on. Yeah, we, we, we can continue answering the questions after the discussion so we can stay. Okay, thank you. So. Um, in trying to define what sustainable development is and whether it could be its own field or is already, I was also wondering whether there's a danger in trying to do too much almost. Um, so the way I understood all three speakers is actually that sustainable development could be its own field because if someone is in the discipline of building cars, you cannot just tell that person to make the car sustainable because that person alone couldn't extend its own discipline towards that additional thing. Or if someone designs um, legal systems, you couldn't just ask that person to make the legal system also sustainable um, and be done with it because someone has to holistically understand all disciplines together and then do future projection scenario modeling. But, I mean, that is, I mean, that's like almost too much for a single discipline. I mean, that, I mean, who could, I mean, 
where are sort of the core competencies of that field then if one could argue that it's really whoever does sustainable development basically has to be capable of doing everything or at least having enough understanding of the sub-disciplines to put them together in a forward-looking model. So I was just wondering as, a, as I'm very much in favor of sustainable development becoming its own discipline, whether there could be a strategic thought around are we maybe trying to do too much almost and should we reduce it again to some core competencies rather than trying to add more and more to our plate? I think that's the question. That's you. Uh, good question, Christoph. Um, the, my answer would be, and I think you know, different people will, will probably answer that differently, would be that you, you do need a group of people who are looking at the synthetic aspects of the, of the question, basically, you know, what, what do we have to know about the system and how the individual components interact without trying to solve every problem that's related to that, because we, we can actually, fortunately, rely on a lot of research that's going on within existing disciplines on which we can draw. So what, what I think is at the core of the task that we have at hand is to organize that knowledge and do the best we can in putting it into a global context and, and figuring out you know, how, how it can be applied. And, and how it can make a difference, rather than saying we have to understand everything about the Earth system from the way the subsystems interact, how they um, express themselves, these interactions, onto the, the future of the planet, to understanding how to you know, understand a climate model, for example, or an, an ecosystem model in, in all its uh, technical details. I think that would be completely overreaching. So I, I do think we, if we are um, sort of setting the boundaries, it should be on the, on the synthetic level and on the um, system interaction level. Um, this question is uh, for Kavira about the history of sustainable development. Um, it was a very interesting perspective about uh, post-colonialism. Um, in my doctoral dissertation, I try to address also the issue of uh, the history of sustainable development, but from another perspective. I did it from the environmental perspective. And environmental. environmental perspective, and I went back to, I basically said that environment and population grow, specifically after the Second World War, mm -hmm. were the ones that started to initiate um, several uh, movements, specifically in the United States. Uh, it's just to remind some that, for instance, the work of Eric with the population boom, Carl, uh, Carson with the uh, Southern Springs, Harding with the Trial of the Commons, um, when the um, Cuyahura River caught fire, I initiated mobilization that um, led to the uh, Earth Day in 1970s, and in 1972, obviously, we had the conference in Estocolm. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly in that conference when Indira Gandhi introduced from my perspective, introduce the aspect of poverty when she said that poverty is the biggest polluter. And from, from that point, from what I, I, I try to analyze in my dissertation, is that sustainable development or, or the environmental issue that was happening and the economic issue start to see poverty and the North and South and developing countries to be a role in sustainable development. So is, is that uh, perspective Totally different than what you see, or, or do you see that that is more related to the colonialism factor that you mentioned in your, in your presentation? Well, um, poverty comes up as, um, I think when Indira Gandhi refers to poverty as a, as a key issue relating to sustainable development, it goes back to the, the, the main post-colonial promise that the, the new Indian nation made in the 1950s was really the commitment to eradicate poverty. And almost every social issue that you present to policymakers is viewed through the lens of poverty. And it's interesting that when I go, um, when I've gone to speak again, I come back to my, uh, to, to the work I do on population aging, when I go and speak to, um, to a policymaker and say, uh, what are the policies with regard to aging people, they will constantly say that 
In terms of a policy category for those who are old, we don't have that. But in terms of looking at people who are poor or, or below the poverty line, we can look at old people who are below the poverty line. They exist for us. But in terms of, a, of, of another category, in terms of seeing other development categories, I think that's been very, very lacking. Since the 1950s, poverty has been critical, and I think there's a colonial legacy of famines. And it was a very, it, I mean, it, it, was very, it was a very important enterprise in terms of justifying a new nation to be able to say, that you would eradicate poverty. And uh, poverty has been such an important slogan, especially for Indira Gandhi through most of her election campaigns. So I think what she was trying to do internationally is really to project what was already her national base in terms of someone who, um, she had the slogan called Garibi Hatao, which means eradicate poverty forever from India, from the Indian villages, everywhere else. So I think it is very closely tied to, to her national vision which she was projecting uh, internationally. But it's interesting that Indira Gandhi also had a very strong commitment to ecology. She was very closely interested with wildlife preservation in India, especially with the preservation of the tiger. So she, I mean, she could see this sense of, she was one of the few, I mean, when you look at the sorts of electoral politics she had, which were quite brutal and which were not very democratic often, if you set that aside, you can, also, you can see quite, um, in, in many of her writings, you can see quite a lot of sensitiv sens sensitivity in terms of her understanding of both wildlife, the balance between wildlife, poor people in terms of resources in the forest, and what's the balance between human beings exploiting forests, and what's the place of wildlife. So you can see that, and I think there's a, she, but she's, this, this particular, in this particular instance, it sounds definitely like she's referring to a legacy of the, the poverty alleviation programs, which were very critical uh, at that point. I've not, we can discuss this further if you want. Thanks. Hi, my name is Shweta Jujunwala. I am in the Sustainability Management Program, second year. My question is, generally when we speak about sustainable development, we refer to the developing countries. And that's even reflected in that definition, which ends in the world's poor. However, if you look at issues like climate change, I think there is a huge need for sustainable development in developed countries, as they are continuing to build cars, search for oil, and all the other issues we are seeing. So what is Earth Institute's position on that, and do you actually focus part of your research and everything around developed countries as well, or is it mostly only developing? We, we actually, if you look at the mission of the Institute, but also at the activities, which is more important in the context of your question of the Earth Institute, it does have uh, one focus on the developing world, on, on the, the poor, but it also, has many activities that deal with global issues that include developed countries. For example, carbon management, who emits it, which is mainly the US, Canada, and you know, China, of course, due to the number of people now, uh, uh, comes up as a, as a major emitter. It looks at uh, global water uh, problems, energy uh, supply. So there are, there are many, many activities that are dealing with issues that the developed uh, countries are facing. So we, we don't try to separate those, but for most of the topics that we are dealing with, there is a seamless transition from uh, sm small scales to large scales and from uh, you know, developed to developing countries. Hi. Um, I'm here representing my community-based private uh, charitable and educational foundation called the Francis York Charitable Trust Endowment. And one comment that was made recently at this uh, beginning of this discussion was that uh, the polluters are the people that are further polluting the, uh, the planet. I guess, I think in the context of my participation on committees at the UN, that the two words sustainable development are what we should look to the future. I'm on the Mental Health Committee and I'm helping to rebuild the Health Committee so that sustainable development is the only thing we can use as a focus point to achieve health and mental health for all the world's populations, whether you look at it locally, regionally, or throughout all the nations of the work, regardless of their status in development at this current time. Now, I was troubled by that word about uh, the people who pollute. In the early 1980s, I worked for Nabisco Brands, which, as we all know, is a Fortune Top Ten company. I worked in Wilton, Connecticut, at their World Headquarters Research Laboratories as a senior systems analyst, 
responding to all the departments from the head administration office to, in your context, developmental molecular biology, developing new food products and assessing throughout the world what locations we should plant plantations from cantaloupe plantations in Mexico to coffee plantations in uh, Ethiopia to uh, something else, I can't remember what, in Chile. Uh, as I know, you know, Nabisco is the parent company for many smaller companies. So uh, in thinking of that, 30 years ago, at the time of the OPEC embargoes, or shortly thereafter, I spoke with some of my colleagues from biochemistry and developmental um, chemistry, organic and inorganic chemistry, and said, what can we do about the simple issue of plastics? Now, plastics require petroleum-based products to be produced. That's a non-renewable resource. Moreover, once they're produced, they, in theory at least, last forever. I look at this one little knife. Now, this is something I found over at the Foo Foundation. This is made from vegetable proteins. Why was I interested in that? Because 30 years ago at Nabisco, as a senior systems analyst, I said to the chemical and biochemical people, I said, can't we polymerize some sort of a renewable thing and make it into something to replace plastics? Plastics go into toxic landfills throughout the face of the planet. Make something from a sustainable resource that will biodegrade. From, that's Fortune Top 10 Company. I was a scientist, so I'm really troubled, slightly embarrassed, and I'm so sorry that this individual doesn't know in working in private industry that we've spent 30 years trying to sustainable development for the health and well-being, mental health of the world populations. So I'd like to know, it seems to me, based upon the frustrations I've faced over all that time, that it's not the scientists in Top 10 industry that are holding back, but how do you get these? I found this over at the Foo Foundation in the cafeteria. 30 years, it, it was developed back then. Um, the Teamsters Union, in fact, made a few um, steering wheels from a polymerized vegetable protein. And that would have been about SIRSA 1987. So why is it that these simple things that are building a Mount Everest down on Staten Island with water dripping through there, creating toxic waste for the world, the Staten Island populations uh, right next door to that landfill, why is it I can't get these out into people use it? In fact, I brought this to my rabbi at the old Broadway synagogue, which is participating with some of the discussions of the local community about the slurry walls. Uh, Columbia's interest in building new construction down on 125th Street. He said, don't bring that in here, it's not kosher. I said, why is it not kosher? It's improving health, it's not damaging the planet. I'm going to go to uh, all the rabbis I know and get a definitive opinion. You're only a rabbi, you're not the rabbi. This should be kosher, plastic should be the thing that's not kosher. As he had piles of plastic knives throughout the synagogue for our kiddush on one Saturday. So I'm saying to you, you know, why can this not be distributed? It seems it's an accessible. I've been talking about this for 30 years from top 10 industry. Why is it not distributed? If it's available, why do people not know about it? Where's the media? Thank you. I think that's an excellent point. So maybe we have time for one more question, and then um, we'll uh, draw this to a close. All right, thank oh, you. Hi. Okay, um, two more questions. <laughs> okay, my, my name is Mpule and I'm from Botswana, so I'm going to ask a question that is specific somewhat to Africa. But it really does piggyback off on what the gentleman was asking about, um, you know, the potential of dealing with too much in sustainable development. Um, from the 2007 food crisis and the rise in food prices, one of the things that, of course, has gained... Um, uh, you know, a lot of attention is the role of agriculture in Africa. And going into that is looking at gender equality and how gender inequality is uh, uh, affecting the potential of the agricultural sector to be more productive. Uh, going into that then, there's the whole thing now of talking about social institutions and how they discriminate against women. So, you know, long before you talk about other sectors that affect sustainable development in women, things like water and, and energy and um, you know, land, without even talking about things like land grabs, just looking at just you know, the, the, the health of land and soil in Africa. You're looking now at social institutions and how you can address 
you know, discriminatory social institutions as a way of empowering um, African women, and hopefully then that would contribute to, you know, the um, green revolution that is, you know, widely being touted. So I was hoping that Professor Pollack, you know, having to do with religion would also talk about, you know, when we're talking about social institutions, even the most harmful social institution does not stand by itself. So even when you look at something like female genital mutilation, um, it's woven into the fabric of a society. So as harmful as it is, and as much as we need to eliminate these social institutions, you know, we, we cannot look past the fact that it, it's not just about that institution, it's embedded within who those people are and how they define themselves, and probably things like marriage and respect and all kinds of things. So really then, how do we approach this kind of work then when we're talking then about fundamentally changing people's cultures and traditions as a way of promoting gender equality and, and women's empowerment and, and then of course trying to then hoping that that will lead to poverty eradication and that in empowering women then that will address health and food and nutrition and all these other security issues. Just a couple of general principles. Um, I'll go back to my last sentence. I think the key point that must be in any answer to your question is, you don't guess it, you ask. And you engage in conversation with unentitled women, with oppressed women, with veiled and guarded women, with women who have no control over their bodies and no control over their education. You don't come top down and do a favor. You go and learn what's asked for. And in our work, in our no local communities, we are not in Africa. We are in our neighboring community working with fellow New Yorkers to figure out what it is we from Columbia can help them with, not what we at Columbia know they need. I think the difference in attitude is the difference between post-colonial and pre-universal. Uh, we are one species. We try to act as if we are sharing that problem. Just, just one quick uh, comment on that. <clears throat> I think as we are moving forward and as we get a better uh, sort of sense of what is needed, we are actually including what, what we call stakeholders, which in, in this uh, case would be um, the women that you talk about, into the definition of the problems, into the definition of how we research them. And that, there is a, a, a strong trend towards that, and I think it will actually, as, as we, you know, once, once that process has uh, moved even further, it, it will address these, these issues so that we are not researching um, in parallel or in a vacuum and then say, you know, knowledge must have an impact, you know, whatever we do, that must be some good, but that we really start to turn that process around and say, especially in, in fields like sustainable development, what are the real problems as they are perceived by those who are hit by them, and take that into the design of our research and, and, and education and, and outreach components, practice components. Final question then. Yes, thank you. Um, as I was listening to you, I have uh, two concerns of uh, the human condition, um, particularly in these times that we're in. Um, those are the situation of greed for those that are using the resources and gaining great wealth, and the complacency for the un uh, within the unempowered um, that feel they can't change things and how to address that when given, um, as Mr. Pollock uh, identified, uh, already the um, level of research done in biology and translation research, looking for patentable uh, genetic coding that um, Monsanto, for example, wants to claim corner the market and seed. Well, how does that affect um, the conversations of sustainable development when you're up against these huge forces. Again, I'm not going to give you a formulaic answer. I'll refer back to my talk to say that nothing in current biomedical research precludes or shadows or diminishes the reality of people having the capacity to change their minds. 
And the burden on us is to find a language that works to accomplish that for all people, not for just people in control, but for people who are controlled. And in fact, I would say the larger barrier is the failure to find a language to share the problem of being controlled with those who are. But I don't believe it's impossible, and I don't believe there's any DNA-driven difference among us because of our circumstance that prevents a common understanding of the need to act together. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bob. So um, I'd like to close the seminar now by thanking the three speakers again and also thanking the audience for a lot of the interesting discussion that we had. And um, I think you can um, go to the Earth Institute website and get information about pre um, seminars that are coming up in this particular series. So thank you very much.